Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from comments on the videos posted on both YouTube and Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, are you finally going to do a true video hands-on review about Chrome OS or Chrome OS Flex since it may be a great introduction to some Windows users to Linux, giving that well-balanced area between proprietary and open source goodness. Cheers for great content as always. First, let me thank you for your kind words. And I'm also going to say welcome to the channel because I'm assuming you haven't been around that long because anyone that's watched a few of my videos know that I'm uh, I'm all about free and open source software, right? I don't cover proprietary software. I don't like proprietary software, right? I'm never going to cover a piece of proprietary software and say anything good about it. So that's why you've never seen anything about Chrome OS on my channel. I'm never going to go buy a Chromebook. I'm never going to have a machine that runs a proprietary operating system on it. That's fundamentally against everything <laughs> that I believe in, right? So I'm never going to tell people I spend so much time trying to get people to leave proprietary operating systems like Windows, for example, since you mentioned Windows. I get, I'm get i trying to get people to leave Windows for free alternatives, mainly Linux, because that's the best free and open source operating system out there. There's others, and we've got various BSD operating systems and Haiku and React OS and various other Unix-like operating systems out there, but they're not ready for prime time, right? The, the driver problems and things like that, where Linux is a very mature desktop operating system that people can switch from Windows to Linux. So that's why I focus on Linux, but mainly I'm focused on free and open source software, right? So I'm not going to give Chrome OS any coverage. I'm not going to tell people to leave the AIDS that is Windows and come over to the cancer that is Chrome OS, right? That, that makes no sense, right? I'm not going to you know, cure their one disease and tell them to go infect themselves with another you know, disease. That, that's not the way we do it. Let's cut out the tumor that is Windows but we're not going to replace it with another tumor. Let's actually heal ourselves and get people to go to a truly free, as in freedom, operating system that is GNU slash Linux. And I hear from people like this a lot, especially you know, Chrome OS is built on Linux, right? Uh, Android is built on Linux. They're both proprietary operating systems, though. The Linux kernel is free. It's licensed under the GPL. It's free and open source software. The kernel is. But those operating systems that Google builds around the Linux kernel, they are proprietary. Chrome OS is proprietary. Android is proprietary. They're not free operating systems. I said, why well, I never talk about them? I don't care about them, right? I'm never going to tell people to go use them. That, that's not what I do. It's the same argument with uh, proprietary browsers like Vivaldi and Microsoft Edge. Well, they're built on the open source Chromium engine. Yeah, that doesn't make them open source. They're still The stuff they put on top of that open source engine in Microsoft Edge and Vivaldi makes it a proprietary, they, they license it under a proprietary license. It's proprietary software. You can't be free and open source software and proprietary at the same time. You're either one or the other. And people try to find this weird middle ground, like Chrome OS is a perfect balancing area between proprietary and open source goodness, was part of the comment. There's no, there's no area between proprietary and open source. It's either one or the other. You can't have it both ways, right? <laughs> you can't. I went to the gym today and I worked out and I actually asked this guy a question and this is a perfect analogy here. Uh, he's, he was a big guy, swole up and he was doing some uh, squats and I asked him, uh, did he take anything? And, and obviously I'm talking about performance enhancing drugs, right? Steroids. I asked him, hey, do you take anything? He says, half and half. He says, I'm not really a user, but sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll take some stuff for a while and then I for a little while, I won't take some stuff. So he's he's not really on steroids. He just he's half and half on steroids, right? That's, you can't have it both ways. You're either taking something or you're not. And you're either open source or you're proprietary. You can't try to find a weird middle ground. There is no middle ground to be had. The next question is, hey DT, question: How do you look so good for your age? Four smiley faces. Appreciate the smiley faces, and I appreciate the kind words. I, I don't know if I look that great for my age. I, I will say I typically, people think I'm a lot younger than I am. I'll be 45 later this year. I'll turn 45, and I probably do look younger than that. I But that's been the case my whole life, you know. Throughout my entire life, I've always looked younger than I actually was. I don't know. I... I I would say it's good living as far as obviously I work out, you know, I spend a lot of time at the gym. I try to eat right. You know, I try to do good things, but 
I'm going to be honest, a lot of it is just genetics because I have, you know, sisters. I've got uh, sisters that uh, honestly, they look <laughs> the same. <laughs> like I've got a sister that's two years younger than me and one that's five years younger than me. And I would say both of them pass for being younger than they are. I just think, you know, some people have the right genetics you know they just they, they get a pass on some things where some people you know unfortunately they they get the, a bad roll of the dice and you know i'm because I've, I've got friends that i went to high school with them of course i would be the exact same age with these people that i graduated with and some of these guys i look at them and they look like they're 70 years old and they're broke down and they're just barely getting by and you know unfortunately it, life's a crapshoot, right? And, and sometimes you get dealt a good hand, sometimes you don't. Moving on. Hey, DT, will you be taking pull requests on your projects? He's talking about my GitLab projects, and specifically that comment came from the video I did the other day creating that GTK app using uh, Haskell and Python. Will I take pull requests? Yes, but know that that was an example application right I, I don't mind you guys doing pull requests on it go ahead but don't be surprised if i don't take them uh because like if somebody gives me a pull request and rewrites the whole thing i probably won't take it because i made a video right and i covered every line of code that i wrote in that video and then these people are going to go click on the link to uh, that particular GitLab project and want to see the same code that I had in the video, try to understand it. And all of that code has been changed by pull requests. So understand, really with any GitLab project, understand what the purpose of it is. I'll give you another great example, my dot files. I get pull requests on my dot files a lot, and sometimes I'll take them. For example, people will find errors in various config files of mine or something. Hey, there's this one small little error here. Let me correct that for you, and they'll do a, a pull request. I, I'll take it. No problem. But then I'll get people that do weird things in my dot .files repo, which are my personal config files. Like, they'll change all my key bindings and then do a pull request. And it's like, do you really think I'm going to accept that? Why are you changing my key bindings for my personal config for my machine that I work on every day? Why would you do that? But I get people that, that do that. And they, I, again, understand, you know, some of those GitLab repos are, you know, for collaborative community things. Like if you want to contribute code, that's fine. But then when it's really personal stuff or in the other day, the, the code examples for these GTK apps, feel free to do those pull requests, but understand don't do like any kind of major rewrite or anything like that. If you do that, I probably won't accept your pull request, but what I'll probably do is I will just, uh, put that as a completely separate example. Um, maybe I'll just keep that uh, particular GitLab repository, which I called code examples. Yeah, if you guys want to submit stuff, yeah, I'll probably accept it. But I've got to keep the original file the same because, again, that's a reference from a video. I, I can't butcher that up because, again, people are going to go to it and, and wonder what the hell happened to the original file. And the next question is one I've gotten before, and I think I've probably answered it on a previous edition of Hey DT, but it's Hey DT, have you looked at PeerTube? What are your thoughts on it? And I'm getting this question because I did the video the other day about Odyssey, about alternative video platforms, you know, alternatives to YouTube. And PeerTube is great because it's free and open source software, it's peer to peer, and it sounds like a great idea. But the problem with PeerTube is it's self-hosted, meaning I have to run my own PeerTube server, right? It's not, it's not like a service like a Odyssey or, or even YouTube, you know, where uh, any creator can just upload their videos because it's on somebody else's servers. They don't have to pay, you know, because it's expensive running your own server, especially storage costs. You know, I've got many, many terabytes of videos. <laughs> I'm talking about the rendered videos. I'm not even talking about trying to store all the clips and things that I you know, eventually made the videos out of. If I had to store all of that stuff, I mean, we'd be talking about dozens of terabytes or just what I do. Also, I only record in 1080p. If I did 4K, we would be talking maybe hundreds of terabytes of storage. That's massive amounts of cost. I mean, you're talking about many hundreds of dollars a month to run a PeerTube server it's not going to have any income coming in, right? <laughs> because it's, there's no ad network on, on my own peer to uh, thing. You're like, like, I can't really, I, I would have to beg people for money just to try to break even on the cost on something like that. And there's no way I'd probably break even on it. So it makes it tough. Peer tube is not appropriate. And, and I'm a bigger channel, right? Like I've got a lot of viewers, a lot of subscribers, and I do make enough money on my YouTube stuff 
that I could sacrifice a few hundred bucks a month and make that PeerTube server if I really wanted to. I, I wouldn't want to, but I, I could probably do it. Think about smaller creators. They can't do that. Of course, smaller creators are not going to have as much storage needs. You know, they're not going to have as big a catalog. But what you'd have to do with smaller creators is a bunch of them probably have to get together and share the cost of a server. And then you're dependent on other people to maintain that server. If you're doing a, a shared server with somebody, you better hope one day they, they don't forget to pay the hosting bill and you know, you lose everything. And that's another real problem with something like PeerTube. It, you know, PeerTube, again, it sounds like a great idea and I would love to support it and I would love to have my own PeerTube instance. But right now, I'm not sure it makes sense. Maybe one day I'll do it, though. I, I'm not completely ruling it out, but right now, yeah, I'm going to have to pass on it. And the next question is uh, referring to a video I made a couple of weeks back about auto starting programs on Linux. He writes, hey, DT, how do you handle auto start with programs or software not made for tiling window managers like Megasync, Steam, Flameshot, etc.? OK, so I use a tiling window manager, but everything I did on that video about auto starting programs, it doesn't matter. Your programs don't care what window manager you run like these programs these programs aren't written with a window manager in mind they're just programs right when i open up uh, my file manager pc man fm it wasn't written for a floating window manager or a tiling window manager or any specific it, it was just a program that was written the same thing with your terminal emulators and your web browsers they don't care same thing with auto starting programs right it doesn't matter if it's a uh, desktop environment, floating window manager, tiling window manager, whatever. Throw it in .config slash auto start, and that program should auto start when you log in again to whatever window manager or desktop environment you happen to be using. And the next question is, hey, DT, wish you would have kept your Gopher alive. Gemini is OK, but it needs special browsers, while Gopher works fine in W3M. Good luck, and please make more videos like this. And he's referring to the Gopher protocol and the Gemini protocol. Those are two alternative protocols to HTTP, to the standard web protocol. And I, I had a Gopher hole set up at one time. I eventually abandoned it. I don't maintain a Gopher server anymore. I, and then I had a Gemini capsule. I don't maintain that anymore. I, I gave up the Gemini server because it was too much work. I can't, I have to have a website, right? So I, I have a presence on the web, but I don't want to maintain basically three different sites, right? Because I got to maintain a website, then I got to maintain a Gemini site, then I got to maintain a Gopher site. And that was too much work for me, for... I, I'm limited on time because mainly I spend so much time making videos, right? I, I'm, I'm really limited on time, everything outside of the video stuff, such as maintaining websites. So th that's the reason I gave up Gopher and Gemini, but that's just for me. I still am happy I made those videos about setting up a Gemini server and a Gopher server. And you guys that are happy with those protocols, keep using it. I hope more people use them. And I'm not saying that I'll never use Gopher or Gemini in the future. I actually would love to still maintain a Gemini capsule, but I'm going to have to work out some way where what I'm going to have to eventually do is set up something to where I can create my website and it automatically generates a Gemini capsule for me. Uh, I, I'm going to have to automate the process in some way. And, and until I work out something like that right now, it doesn't make sense because it, it's just too time consuming for me to maintain all that stuff right now. And I, again, because you kind of have to be on the web right now, I'm just going to maintain a website. The next question. Hey, DT, can you do a review of a GNU slash herd distro? I think Debian has one. And I've got a train blowing a horn here near the office. I'm not redoing this clip, though. We're going to go with it. I hope you guys don't get annoyed by the train blowing. But can I review a GNU slash herd distribution? No. <laughs> There's no way. I could never run a fully free GNU operating system complete with the GNU herd kernel because it's, there's no driver support. It's just, I can't even run a fully free, as in freedom, Linux Libre distribution because I need proprietary blobs, proprietary drivers for various things. I could never install GNU herd on my, any of my machines and actually do what I do. There's no way I could, I'd have to quit making video content, right? I'd have to quit doing anything I like, because most of the stuff I do on my computer would not be possible on GNU Herd. So no, I'm not going to review it. I'd have to review it in a virtual machine for one thing, because I couldn't put it on my real equipment uh, because it, it wouldn't work on my real equipment. And what am I going to do in a virtual machine? A virtual machine is not going to tell you whether that thing works or not <laughs> as far as hardware support. I know it's not going to work. And it would be irresponsible for me 
to do a video about it and then try to convince you guys to go try it out and use it when I know it's not going to work for me. It's not going to work for you either. Right. I already know that. So no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. That is cool that Debian has a uh, herd flavor. Uh, Debian's always had some weird stuff going on with it as far as they maintain some some strange additions of Debian. One thing Debian calls itself good news slash Linux because they are fans of the free software movement. And so the, the, in deference to the contributions of GNU and the Free Software Foundation, Debian has always called itself from the very beginning, Debian GNU slash Linux. And they like the ideals of the free software movement. So that's great that they maintain an ISO with the herd kernel. It's not going to be usable. <laughs> but Debian, I, for a while, I remember Debian, I think also maintained a free BSD. Uh, distribution as well. Debian, it was a Debian slash FreeBSD. It was like you know, the Debian stuff on top of the FreeBSD kernel. I'm, I'm pretty sure they had that years ago. I remember seeing that around. But again, at the end of the day, the Linux kernel, the big generic Linux kernel with all the driver support, that's what people need for proper desktop laptop support. When you get into some of the alternative kernels, you're going to run into problems, right? That's great that those things exist. And maybe one day these things like the herd kernel will get to the point where they're actually usable. But right now they're not usable. It's just not a viable alternative right now. And moving on is a comment. Hey, DT, I feel that Astro Vim beats Doom Emacs. Astro Vim beats Doom Emacs at, at what? I, I, I get these kinds of questions and comments sometimes, and the, these things tell me nothing. Astro Vim beats Doom Emacs. At, at, at what? Cards? Dominoes? Tiddlywinks? <laughs> like, what, what, what are we talking about here? For one thing, let's forget about the distributions, Astro Vim and Doom Emacs. Let's talk about under the hood, Vim and Emacs. They're not even the same program, right? They're, not, they're totally different things. Emacs is a graphical GUI program. Vim is a terminal program. You have to run it inside a terminal. Yeah, I know GVim exists, but GVim is uh, very bad. <laughs> it's not usable. Uh, so for one thing, they're fundamentally very different things, Vim and Emacs. You can't compare them. So I don't know one beats the other. No, because they're not even trying to do the same things. It's like saying, hey, apples beat oranges. At what? <laughs> I guess if you like apples, maybe apples beat oranges. But sometimes you need a recipe that calls for oranges, right? You can't use an apple for that thing. <laughs> and the final question is, hey, DT, what's your thoughts on the current situation with elementary OS? It's a great Linux distribution, and it's very sad that it's facing some troubling times. For those of you that are not up to date on the current situation with elementary elementary has two co-founders that are part of the company that is behind elementary one of the co-founders last week posted that they needed to go get a real job and were leaving the company and they sold their half of, of the company to the other co-founder the other co-founder is also complaining about not making enough money and may needing to go find a, a, a real job and who knows what the future of elementary OS what's in store for it right and you know right now all we can do is just wait and see it's one of those things Linux distributions unfortunately come and go I've seen a lot of Linux distributions die in my you know, 15 years or so of using desktop Linux. And many of them I love, many I, I used. And, and one day you just wake up and they're gone. That's fine. We've got we've got so many Linux distributions out there. It's not like it's not the end of the world. I know people think it's just crazy when they're the distribution they use dies. No, no, it's not. You'll be OK. Trust me on that. You'll be OK. Uh, if you can't handle this, then Linux is not for you, unfortunately, because a lot of your community based Linux distributions, especially, are not going to be here in five years, 10 years, 15 years, right? They come and go again. Now, Elementary OS, I'm a big fan. I am a supporter of theirs on Patreon. I donate a few bucks a month to them on Patreon, even though I'm not an elementary user, uh, their desktop environment and all, it's, it, it looks great. I, I think it's great, especially converting new to Linux users from Windows or Mac over to Linux. I think it's a great beginner Linux distribution. Personally, it, it's not for me, but again, that's just a personal thing. Uh, I love the fact that elementary exists. It's different. You know, most Linux distributions are all kind of doing the same thing where the elementary guys were really making something unique and exciting, and they really differentiated themselves from the rest of the crowd. 
and I want them to succeed. And I'm going to continue to support them on Patreon, and I hope you guys continue to support them, those of you that are. If you're not supporting them, go give them a few bucks, because right now they're hurting financially. I think that's the main thing is these guys. It's one of those things you work on something you get burnout, you put in a lot of hours, especially when you're not getting rewarded for it the way you should. And everybody feels like they, they're underpaid, right? It doesn't matter what job you do. Everybody is underpaid. You are not making what you think you are worth. And sometimes people are, are in fact, not making any, any amount of money <laughs> what they should be making. And this is something that many Linux dis distributions face. And I think it's unfortunate. And I hope that elementary OS is able to survive and, and, and thrive in the future. A lot of this, though, is not dependent on finances. Um, a, a lot of this, ultimately, sometimes people just change. Like, you know, sometimes people decide, hey, this thing I've been working on forever, I no longer want to work on it. And that's OK. That's cool. Um, so, and, and there's nothing, again, there's nothing anybody can really do about that unless you want to go take up the mantle and help the elementary team out. And if that's the case, hey, get in touch with, with the founder of elementary that's still around, Danielle Fourier, and uh, let her know that you are interested in helping out the project. If you can, if you code, I, I know they spend a lot of their time coding in Vala, you know, for the GTK stuff. And if those of you that can contribute financially, hey, go help them out. I, I mentioned they have a Patreon. Uh, they, I'm sure, take donations and other ways as well. I'm not sure, but I'm sure you can go to the elementary website and find a link where you can give them money, probably through PayPal or something like that. I'm not sure on that. But yeah, go help those guys out because honestly, I think the Linux ecosystem would be a much dimmer and darker place if elementary OS wasn't a part of it. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. Devin Gabe James, Maxim, Matt Michael, Mitchell, Paul Scott, Wes, Alan, Armor Dragon, Chuck, Commander Angry, Diokai, Dylan, George, Lee, Lennox Ninja, Mike, or Jan, Alexander, Peace Arch, and Fedora, Polytech, Red Prophet, Stephen, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. It's just me and you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to help me out, look for DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace. Vim beating Emacs. That guy must have been drinking. <laughs>